Before COVID-19 arrived, and definitely since, anxiety has been a constant companion for many people. That doesn't sound good, but for some, there may be a silver lining. Wendy Suzuki, a neuroscientist at New York University, explains why in her new book, Good Anxiety, Harnessing the Power of the Most Misunderstood Emotion. And she joins us now from Manhattan Island in New York City for more. Dr. Suzuki, it's great to have you on TVO tonight. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Not at all. I thought we'd start by reading an excerpt from the book, and then we'll come back and chat. So, Sheldon, if you would, let's bring this graphic up, and we'll all read along together. From global pandemics to crashing economies to intense daily family challenges, we all have plenty of justifiable reasons to feel anxious. The relentless 24-hour news cycle and the constant stream of social media just add to this unease. We are surrounded by too much information to filter and too much stimulation to relax. The stress of daily living seems inescapable. Is feeling anxious inevitable? I'm going to get you to answer that question in a second, but before you do, is there an official definition of anxiety you can give us so we're all on the same page here? Absolutely. The definition of anxiety that I use is that feeling of fear or worry typically associated with an uncertain situation, which helps explain why in this age of COVID-19 that anxiety levels, both clinical levels and everyday levels of anxiety, have risen globally. Absolutely. Now, you presumably could have studied any number of thousands of different things, but you chose anxiety. How come? Because, and this was even before the start of the pandemic, I started to notice a, a really noticeable increase in anxiety in my students at New York University, uh, not only in the students, in my friends, in my colleagues, in myself. There was definitely something happening there. And um, that is what made me inspired to start to look at this from a neuroscientist perspective. And now to the very timely question that you just asked in the book there, and particularly given what we've all been through over the last 19 months, is feeling anxious inevitable? Yes. Anxiety is one of our natural emotions. And it is not surprising that in situations where there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear, and um, uh, as we've all experienced, that we will all have these feelings of anxiety. Just because the feelings of anxiety are inevitable does not mean that there are not approaches to turn that volume down. In fact, I spend so much of my book talking about the science-based approaches to turn the volume down on your anxiety, which is the first way to start to get to good anxiety, which <laughs> I talk about. Indeed, but presumably we, I mean, it's evolutionary. We need some of it to, to make sure we don't get in trouble, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Anxiety at its core from an evolutionary perspective, not only the emotion of anxiety, but that physiological stress response that comes with it is protective for us. It's in fact critical for our survival. So um, it is protective and critical, even though I know all of you out there are thinking, I'm not feeling protected by my anxiety one little bit. And the reason is because collectively as a society, our anxiety levels have been turned up so high with not just COVID, but global warming and news cycles and social media, and even the weather report can be scary these days. Hmm. So um, step number one, is turning down the volume on your anxiety. It may also be the case, I guess, that, that, well, there's kind of two different kinds of anxiety. There's the everyday anxiety that you write about in this book, and then there's the sort of clinical anxiety, which is a much more, that's a different thing. You're focusing yes. on the first. How, yes. how would you distinguish it from the second? So the second is, um, you know, it is that debilitating form of anxiety, uh, clinical levels of anxiety uh, that have gone up uh, um, to 30% of the population since the pandemic. Before the pandemic, it was about 20%. Now it's 30% of the population have clinical levels of anxiety. It's debilitating. It stops you from being able to live your everyday life. And um, that is when you need a medical professional. So if it is stopping you from... Um, doing your job, from having normal relationships, that is when you should start to consider uh, going to see a, a professional. And the physical consequences of all of that can be what? 
The physical consequences are daunting and devastating. This is essentially the physical consequences of long-term stress, that physiological stress response that comes with anxiety. Every time we're anxious, what happens is our heart rate goes up, our respiration goes up, and blood gets shunted to our muscles so that we can either run or fight, that fight or flight response, which is great in the moment. That is why it is protective and essential for our survival. But imagine having that response all the time uh, at every drop of a potential uh, uh, scary thing happening that is happening all, all around us. What happens is long-term, physiologically, it leads to heart problems, heart disease, um, ulcers, reproductive problems, and in the brain, high levels of the stress hormone Cortisol can start to first damage and then kill brain cells in your hippocampus and your prefrontal cortex, two brain areas critical for long-term memory and decision-making, um, uh, respectively. Okay, I am going to introduce a new word here. Well, actually, it introduces the wrong word to use because we've talked about it on this program many times in the past, uh, particularly with uh, guests like Dr. Norman Deutsch, who's from around here. We talk about neuroplasticity. And that's yes. what you're into. You want to tell us what yes. that is? So brain plasticity or neuroplasticity is the brain's amazing capacity to be able to change and grow um, in response to the environment. Unfortunately, so that's good positive brain plasticity. There's also negative brain plasticity, which shows that in other negative environments that include a lot of stress, your brain can actually shrink and become damaged. So it can go in both directions. And my whole research program has been in trying to understand those um, interventions that bring us to positive brain plasticity, that helps our brains grow and strengthen. So it is possible to live with anxiety in a healthy way, yes? Yes, absolutely. For example? Think about a situation where there's no anxiety at all, no stress at all. What comes with anxiety and that energy that comes with stress is action. It uh, comes ambition. And so without that stress and, and uh, anxiety, uh, we would be just laying on the couch all over the place. A lot of our motivation comes from that um, uh, emotion of anxiety. And so what I try and do in my book, Good Anxiety, is show you how to channel the energy uh, of anxiety from that too high an energy that, that makes everything spiral down and makes you lose your words and, and not perform well, to that slot where you are performing best. I always say the best talks that I've ever given in my whole life. I was scared. I was anxious before I went on stage. And that is a great example of channeling your anxiety to perform well. So should I infer that because I don't think you're demonstrating any anxiety right now at all in your conversation with me, that you're completely calm and not all that fussed about doing this interview? I am an excellent actress. <laughs> no. I, well done. So, you know, when it's a TV interview and potentially millions of people can see, I am... I am a little anxious before, and I just try and tell myself, enjoy yourself, have a good time, just try and uh, share your knowledge. But, um, you know, it, it, uh, I have skills that have come with being a professor <laughs> and being a public speaker. But, yeah, I, uh, there's something a little bit wrong if I'm not a little bit worried, a little bit tense about, is all this equipment going to work? Is my internet going to go out? Are they gonna ask me? The one thing that really gets me scared is, are they gonna ask me something I don't know the answer to? <laughs> so as long as you don't do that, I'm gonna stay nice and calm. I'll, I'll let you in on a little secret. I feel the same way before each interview too. So we've got that going in common. There you go. Talk to us about your six superpowers, because you do mention them in the book about how to channel good anxiety. The six yeah. are what? Yeah. So, you know, um, the ultimate uh, uh, endpoint of learning how to use your good anxiety, you turn the anxiety down and you kind of learn from those difficult emotions. But it took me to six 
gifts or superpowers that I talk about in the book. And those six gifts are resilience, flow, mindset, productivity, empathy or compassion, and creativity. And um, I don't think we have time to talk about all of them, but these are things that are truly enhanced by your particular form of anxiety. And um, it was something that I realized, you know, with great pain comes great wisdom. And anxiety is, is, can be a painful emotion. It is um, uncomfortable. It is sh pointing out something that we need to pay attention to. And I asked myself, what are the learnings that come from that everyday anxiety? And these are the gifts that came out of that um, examination. Well, here's where our conversation takes a bit of a hard turn because I want to talk about chapter four of your book now. You know what yes. that means. And, and we're going to share with our viewers what that means now. I note with interest that you put resilience as number one on your list of six superpowers. And you, in a very profound and difficult way, found out firsthand about yeah. how resilience could work or needed to work in your life Yes. When, when your poor brother died at the age of 51, would you take us through yes. that, please? Yeah. So, you know, I was in the middle of um, getting ready to really start writing this book. We had the outline ready, and it was the week that I was about to jump in and start writing all about resilience. You know, the book hadn't really before been formed. I wanted to look at the resilience from, uh, sorry, um, anxiety from a positive point of view. But then I experienced um, a real tragedy in my life. Um, it wasn't just my younger brother who suddenly passed away of a heart attack, but it was just three months after our father had passed away unexpectedly of a heart attack. And um, that was an anxiety that was grief. It was deep grief, um, probably the most difficult emotions that I've ever experienced in my life. I felt, you know, after um, getting myself psyched up to dive into the difficult emotions of anxiety, I felt like I, I was I plunged into a master class of difficult anxiety, uh, of difficult emotions when, when this happened. And yes, it took a while to uh, come out of it. It was so painful, but you know, there was a, a moment where I was um, doing a workout with a trainer. It was a video workout and Phoenix, my trainer said, you know, with great pain in the context of working out comes great wisdom about your body. And I thought that is so profound. That is exactly what I need to hear today because I have just gone through the biggest pain in my life. And what I realized is that what came out of it is a new appreciation of love and family and friendship and connection that remained. Um, I talk about it as kind of Dorothy coming out of that black and white part of the movie into the technicolor of Oz. And um, I wish I didn't have to realize that because of the loss of my father and my brother but it was a profound change that has changed my relationship ever since that happened. And I took that learning and that resilience and that, that wisdom um, and I applied it to the book and came out with those six superpowers that we just went through. Um, and the book is dedicated to my father and my brother. And it would not have been the same had, um, had that not happened in the middle of writing this book. Hmm. How long did it take you to get that wisdom? Six months, eight months, something like that. And, you know, I was active about it. I, I always had a regular exercise program. I always had a regular meditation program, um, which I talk about a lot in the book as great tools to combat anxiety. Well, they're also great tools to combat grief. Um, so it was, uh, um, daily workouts, daily meditations, reaching out to friends and, and, um, um, and really kind of coming together in our little pod of the family. My, my mom and my sister-in-law and my niece, um, we're closer now. And I, I appreciate that every day. Hmm. Uh, this may be a bit of a bizarre coincidence to introduce here, but I'm going to try anyway. My father's father died at 51 of a heart attack. So you have that element in common there. 
And I remember asking him many years ago, you know, how do you get over that? You know, no, no, nobody's supposed to die at 51. Yeah. And um, his answer was, we just sort of had to. People were tougher back then. Right. And uh, could I get you to compare tragedies of many years before with tragedies today where we may be more in touch with our emotions today or we may be more understanding of, of being allowed to grieve publicly today in ways that were not possible back then and how yeah. significant those differences might be? Yeah, that's such an interesting question. I mean, my mind um, immediately went to the fact that families were larger and uh, health care wasn't nearly as good. So death and death in your close family members was probably more common than it is today. Um, of course, it still happens as it, as it happened to me, kind of this double whammy. Um, uh, especially my my younger brother, which was the the one that was just so unfathomable. And I, I think that, you know, death has been a constant <clears throat> throughout our evolution. And um, it's always going to be hard um, because we are social species and we we thrive on that social connection no more strongly than with our own family members. And so um, I think it, it, yes, I think uh, your father was right. They they had to do it. We all just have to get over it. There's nothing. There's nothing that we can do. Um, what uh, what is what is valuable, and what I learned from this experience is that um, those uncomfortable feelings, those difficult feelings, are there for a reason. They're telling us how much those people meant to us. And the deeper the feelings and the more difficult the feelings, the more that they meant. So, so it's like an emotional tribute to the person that went away. And I, I took that kernel of knowledge and I tried to apply it to this emotion that has been kind of running rampant, but at its core is also protective. It is helping us. It is showing us what is going well in our lives and what is, what is important to us. We worry about the things that are important to us that in the same way that we grieve for the people that we love the most. What is that signal? And that is the signal that I tried to harness in the six superpowers of anxiety that I talk about in this book. We talked about resilience a lot there. Is there one other one that you that you think we need to, well, I know they're all important, but which, which <laughs> second one would you like to tell us a little more about? Well, uh, the second one and one of my favorites is um, empathy, the superpower of empathy. And this comes from my oldest form of anxiety that I've brought with me since childhood. Um, despite my ability to speak to you uh, and speak to my classroom uh, as a child and a young young student and even a college student. I was very shy. I was um, a wallflower. I was very awkward. And I always had years of really wanting to ask questions in class, but being afraid that I was going to be wrong. Of course, mm -hmm. that's the fear that all students have. And I realized that that form of my own personal anxiety has created an empathy super superpower in me because I'm at the front of the classroom now. And what I find myself doing uh, unconsciously is not just answering the students that raise their hand, love those students, but I always stay late, I arrive early and make sure that all the other students that don't wanna speak in front of class but have plenty of questions for me, do that. It is my teaching superpower. And that's just me. What is your most common anxiety? and you know it well, you know what it feels like, you know what it looks like. Can you turn that to the outside and help somebody else? That becomes your superpower of empathy that originates with your own form of anxiety. In which case, let's finish up on this because we want to leave people with some good advice, as in exercise, deep breaths. Yeah. yeah. Uh, talk about the importance of that, if you would. Yeah, absolutely. So my number one go-to, because everybody asks, you know, I'm, I'm starting to have anxiety. What should I do right now? My number one go-to is deep breathing, because I'm here to tell you that deep breathing is activating your natural de-stressing part of your nervous system 
called the parasympathetic nervous system. This is part of the nervous system that, um, that helps you respond to that fight or flight response by decreasing your heart rate, decreasing your respiration, and shunting blood from your muscles to your digestion and reproductive organs. So the best, easiest, most direct way to activate that is to breathe slowly and deeply. I recommend a boxed breathing technique where you inhale on a four count, hold for four counts, exhale on a four count, and hold for four counts. You can do this um, in the middle of an anxiety provoking conversation when the other person is talking at you and making you anxious. Um, you can teach your kids to do it uh, so they can do it in school when they're starting to get anxious. It is, uh, um, it is a panacea for, for anxiety. Moving your body, taking a walk outside is my number two. Uh, it also, what, what it's doing is stimulating the release of dopamine, serotonin, neuroadrenaline. It's like you're giving your brain a wonderful bubble bath of all of these wonderful neurochemicals and um, that, that act to decrease anxiety and depression levels. So those are my number one and number two go-tos if you need to decrease your anxiety level today. Well, I can tell you, this has been anything but an anxiety-provoking conversation. This has been really helpful. It's been a delight to meet you. Good Anxiety is the name of the book, Harnessing the Power of the Most Misunderstood Emotion, and it's brought Dr. Wendy Suzuki to our virtual studio from New York City today. Thank you so much, Dr. S. It's been great having you on. Thank you so much for having me. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.